All right, and now I'm going to share my screen. Jonathan, are you ready? Are you with us? Hi, everyone. I'm here. Uh, okay. Can you hear me clearly, Marquise? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Gardenhire, uh, and I'm a district leader in the Lower East Side. Uh, I represent the 65th Assembly District Part B. Oh, someone's ringing. Uh, Marquise, I think that that's your screen, so maybe perhaps you should mute as well. Yes, Marquise, uh, sorry. Marquise, there's 14 people in the waiting room that I can't let in. Okay. Uh, so they are in, and I'm going to unmute. Okay. All right. Well, I'm Jonathan Gardenhire. I'm a district leader in the Lower East Side, and I represent the 65th Assembly District Part B. Um, and the 65th Assembly District is about 30% public housing and includes uh, Smith Houses, which is where I live and where I'm from, and what my background is. Um, so I'm so happy to be here and welcome you all uh, to this resident-led town hall. I think that these types of initiatives are important. Um, it's important for us to be able to understand the information that's being given to us in a way uh, that makes sense um, and, and also to create spaces so that we can talk about it um, and have the opportunity to do so, um, uh, you know, in a, in a fair way manner so everyone's heard. Um, so I just want to introduce the Residents to Preserve Public Housing and they are a citywide resident-led group of public housing resident leaders including members of the NYCHA Citywide Council of Presidents Board and they or we aim to preserve public housing by advocating for adequate funding, improving quality of services, and increasing resident decision-making authority. Um, the goal for today's town hall meeting is that uh, the residents to preserve public housing uh, aim to direct respective elected officials to stand with residents in passing a plan that improves and preserve public housing. So during this meeting, um, you'll be able to learn about NYCHA's blueprint for change proposal and discuss potential alternative solutions uh, to that plan. Um, and the last thing that I'll say uh, before I pass it over, or actually I'm gonna go through the agenda, um, but the last thing I say before I go through the agenda is that this is an opportunity with uh, the recent uh, control that the Democrats have gained in Congress um, and our recent uh, supermajority at the state level is really an opportunity to think about uh, the, I'm sorry, maybe I'm going a little bit too fast. I'm going to slow down for translation. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to think about real solutions for NYCHA. And we are at a point because of the supermajority and the uh, and the uh, control of the Senate um, to really, really advocate for ourselves um, and create viable solutions that are, you know, that are tangible, you know, so really, um, I think that this is a time not only to put a halt to the to the blue, to pause the blueprint plan plan, but to really put a halt to it and stop it all together. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, we'll talk about solutions later on. Um, uh, in this meeting, but right now we have two proposals on the table. One is a bill from Nidia Velasquez um, that really puts uh, about $40 million uh, directly to NYCHA. And the other is AOC's Green New Deal for public housing, which is really a, uh, a, a, a sprawling plan that provides sustained funding to public housing and also thinks about how um, we move into toward a greener future. And I think that those are Hi, two possibilities. Um, could y'all slow down, please? It's really hard for the translators or interpreters to like follow. Um, I'm sorry, you. I'm finishing up now, but I think that those are two very tangible possibilities that really um, take advantage, that we can really take advantage of with the control um, that we have. Um, so the agenda to preserve public housing meeting town hall. Um, first is this welcome. And next will be a review of NYCHA's blueprint for change proposal. 
Uh, followed by that will be a panel uh, by impacted resident leaders. So we'll get to hear directly from residents who would be impacted by this plan. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion on NYCHA's blueprint plan for change um, and talk about solutions, which is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, and after that, we'll talk about residents' demands um, and also hear um, the responses that we've received from elected officials. Um, and that's when we'll close the meeting. Um, before I pass it over um, to, uh, to the next point in the agenda, um, I also want to acknowledge and thank all of the elected officials that are present on this call. Um, I uh, can't view everyone right now in the current view, so I'm not going to go down a list. Um, but of course, you know, we're glad that you could join us here. And again, I just want to say that I hope that you use this as an opportunity to listen to your residents uh, and, uh, and really take that in, into consideration uh, when you go, you know, wherever it is that you go to do your job and advocate for us. Uh, and with that, I'll, you know, continue. You guys can continue your meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, so much for bringing us into this meeting and, and setting the scene for us. So as we get into it, it's important that everyone understands exactly what the blueprint is calling for. So before we give you our, um, our opinion, um, our expertise reaction to it, it's important that you understand exactly what the blueprint is calling for. And so to help us understand that I am calling on another public housing resident leader, Mr. Ronald Toppins, to uh, give us a presentation on NYCHA's blueprint proposal. Ronald, are you with us? Um, yeah. Hi, I'm not putting. Um, are, are, are people putting um, people in different rooms right now? Because. Can you hear me? Oh, hold on. Yes, Ron. Give me one second. It's, we have a question that's being asked. We have no breakout rooms currently uh, going on. This is Everyone is in one major room. Okay. And this is, sorry, the. Um, because my interpreter seems to be in a different room right now. So, um, so can you, I'm going to let Ronald, I'm going to let Ronald go through the presentation. Can you call me on the phone and then we can travel okay. together? Thank you. All right. Ronald, you can take us away. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear oh, you. Terrific. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Peace and grace, everyone. Ronald Topping, um, resident council president, Adam Houses. Um, I'm going to talk about several things seeking to address the repairs um, under the RAD and PAC program, um, also a form of public housing preservation trust, which the assembly had a meeting on, because how they are going to convert supposedly 110 um, developments and change it from the Section 9 program over to the Section 8. So originally, and then we need to talk about leverage. So originally the blueprint was released on July 28th of 2020 for Blueprint for Change. It was set to collaborate NYCHA's current, through its CEO, Greg Russ, the NYCHA Blueprint for Change. It was supposed to improve homes, units, infrastructure, protecting the rights of the care for work and efforts to deliver a better service for the residents. What's happened, happening with that particular point is that when we have a hundred, you have 62,000 units that's already involved in going into the RAD program. So with that being said, um, you have 110 that are currently not and so forth. And so what we're trying to do is figure out how are we gonna best service these residents and be able to um, utilize this blueprint, which we don't see very good things that are happening for us in dealing with this. Greg Russ, who is our chair for NYCHA, it's, um, wants to talk about a public benefit um, con um, corporation called the Housing Preservation Trust. 
This could, would, would allow authorities to make potential risky capital infrastructure investments without directly credited on New York State or its municipalities on the line. With this trust, it targets was already a NYCHA mess. It is geared for change for 110 units undefined under the Section 9, converting them into Section 8 and to tap into the tenant protection vouchers. It's to be used for asset supplemental and re renovations for the address but needs for upgrade. Funding the federal government was always needed. We always needed that. We haven't received funding from Congress for such a long time that needs to fund HUD so that we can get things on the road besides putting us in programs and, and, and being able to come up with money because we sign up for these programs. NYCHA crisis has become in need of a serious plan with this blueprint. This blueprint is going to require a HUD signature for, for say, and, this, and more spending from Congress and the state legislated to create the trust. Then they will have attached board members who we are not, we're unsure how those board members are going to be in. Are they going to be elected in or sued in, grandfathered in over this strategy and so forth. So with the remaining of the 10, 10,000 units not yet identified, there's what we call the Real Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, which already is supposed to be taking care of 62,000 units going under, which is a third of NYCHA's housing stock, which is, which is already uh, going to be on the market. What they do is they're going to bring in other realtors like Cross Realty, Tills and Tally, and Wavecrest, which has bad management, which we don't need. So this is part of why we don't agree with this blueprint, because there's no representation from our resident leaders, no organizations, or other, other folks. Now, with this funding, it's supposed to be for upgradings to help housing. They're going to be supposed to be receiving public subsidy for low income. When they talk about uh, housing, this plan deals gears towards affordable housing. What is affordable and so forth? So now HUD has to actually approve this plan. We need HUD to approve the pool of these vouchers. Are they going to be able to check these apartments and be able to go through them to see what it be? Excuse me, can I ask to slow down a little bit? It's getting difficult to interpret. Okay. Yeah. And so with this being said, we need to pull before assigned by specific unit. Congress needs to increase, of course, funding for these vouchers to be appropriated. Now, with, we need to get leverage because now when you're talking about bringing in banks, what you're really saying is you're bringing in other businesses and once banks get a, a hold of pu public policy stock, all the rules are changed and all the things go out the window, such as your resident councils, or such as all the component and safety nets that you have, you will no longer have, residents may, will not be able to have um, great representation from anything. Thank and, you. Let me just close out. They want okay. to use the 40, billion dollars where did they come up with this figure out we have not figured out so all we're asking for is basically a seat at the table and i'm going to close because one of my um persons that always has been able to tell us how we are to attempt to get a seat at the table was written some time ago by a philip randolph and he and he says and i read a banquet table is is is, is Nature are no reserved seats. You get what you can take and you keep what you can hold on to. What you can't take anything, what you can't get anything, you will have to hold on to what you, you can keep. And if you can't take it, then you need to organize and demand it at some point. I thank you all for listening. Um, this was kind of uh, uh, getting this technology down, but I'm giving you some of the ideas and others will tell you what, what is expected of this group represented. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you so much, Ronald. I'm just gonna do a really, really quick recap of the blueprint um, and just, just so you guys, have, in case you have any questions. So the quick and dirty, the blueprint for change is seeking to address the public housing units that are not covered under RAD, right? RAD only, 
the VAD program got permission to convert 62,000 units. So that means that there are 110,000 units left over that NYCHA claims they don't have adequate funding for. The Housing Authority is proposing that a preservation trust be created to which those 110 units will be transferred into. When they are transferred into the <coughs> preservation trust, they will also be converted into a section eight unit. Once, if the preservation trust is approved by state law, HUD approves the Housing Authority for moving those 110,000 units into the trust, the trust will in turn go to HUD and apply for what's known as tenant protection vouchers. The vouchers will bring an additional amount of funding monthly on a yearly basis if approved by HUD and by Congress. NYCHA then wants to use the funding that they get from the tenant protection vouchers and leverage that funding to take to borrow money from banks and private investors. So what's important, what is important to understand is how NYCHA, what NYCHA must do to make this plan a reality. So NYCHA must include it in its annual plan or its five-year plan. If it's not in its five-year plan, they must introduce it as a significant amendment. As Ronald mentioned, in order for this preservation trust to move forward, that requires state law. The housing committee, the standing housing committee in the assembly introduced a bill to create the preservation trust. And in December, they held the hearing on this preservation trust. Again, HUD must give approval HUD must also allow them the ability to pull the vouchers together so that they can go to the bank and say they have a lump sum of money to use as collateral and promise to pay back a loan. It's important to understand that we are talking about 110,000 apartments. And so the question to ask is does Congress have enough? Does HUD have enough tenant protection vouchers to cover? 110,000 units. One can easily say no, given that they are proposing to borrow from banks in this plan. So now that you have a full understanding or somewhat of an understanding of the blueprint, now I wanna take us into some resident stories. We have a few residents here um, who live and reside in a bad converted building. The reason why we are talking about RAD, specifically in this town hall, about NYCHA's blueprint for change proposal is because this blueprint for change proposal is modeled in many ways after RAD. With the exception of the preservation trust, so the purpose of these stories is for you to ask yourself, if there are challenges with RAD and the Housing Authority is creating a model that is similar to RAD, how can we accept this model when we see all the challenges that play out in RAD? So I do Martin, have so one. Sorry, yes. could you please slow down? Um, it's not like that you need to um, speak slowly, rather that there should be spaces in between your, your sentences. Um, and that allows a gap for interpreters to actually do their job. Thank you so much. Perfect, thank you. All, I wanna thank you all for your patience and understanding. We wanna make sure that this is multilingual um, and that everyone has an opportunity to participate. If we want NYCHA to do better, then we must model what it is that we want to see from NYCHA. Uh, so for every now and then, you're going to hear our interpreters correct us and tell us to slow down so that we can make sure everyone is getting all the information. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to hear from some residents who live in a rad converted building. OK, John, oh, OK. Um, Marquise, we're having, 
They're only letting a hundred people and people are getting kicked off. This is an unfortunate problem to have. Um, we are trying to figure out how we can stream it. At this point, I don't think we'll be able to increase our amount of people who can participate in this meeting. So we have uh, one of our members, uh, we have our elected officials waiting in this room. Whew. All right, you know what? We got to keep moving. I'm going to try to troubleshoot. So when I pass this off to our next speaker, I will do some troubleshooting to see if we can get uh, the rest of our folks into this meeting. We have a resident. I'm going to call you out uh, to see if you are present. Uh, those of you who are on the call who live in the Rad Building, we're also going to give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, so if you want to speak, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a few seconds. But for now, I'm going to call on. I'm going to call on Miss Janine Laddenmore Henderson. Uh, Janine, are you with us? Miss Janine, you can mute yourself, unmute yourself. Go on once, twice. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see. Excuse me, this is Belinda Davis. You have people that registered to get in, but like you say, you can't go over 100. Can't you they stream this live on Facebook so other people can see and comment or know what's going on? Yes, thank you for mentioning that. We are working on it. We've been working on it since earlier today. Um, so I'm not going to give you any false expectation, but we are working on it. And as soon as we get it up and running, I'll get the link out. I also want to... I also want to say that we are recording this meeting, so we will be sharing it um, on our social media sites immediately after. And the last thing I'll say is that um, I apologize everyone couldn't get in, um, but we didn't prioritize anyone. We have elected officials and residents who are waiting outside. Um, so we really just let first come, first serve. Uh, so again, I'm going to pass it off. If Janine is not with us, I am looking for a resident who lives in a rad building. If you live in a rad building, please raise your hand. All right. So I, because we don't have anyone speaking, I'm going to uh, locate our speaker and I'm going to keep the agenda moving and move us on to the next portion of our agenda. And for that, I'm going to ask and invite our very own uh, moderator for this piece, Ms. Dana. How are you today? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, exclusive town hall. And this evening, we want to welcome our elected officials, our expert panel, and residents, and our guests. Uh, we will now begin our expert panel segment. And I will begin with the introduction of our panel, which first is Daniel Barber, our CCOP chairman. If you will unmute your mic, please. To play it Danny, are you here? Yes, I am. Yes. Danny, uh, you have five to seven minutes to present your, your case, and I will hope that that will be enough. Uh, so you have the floor. Hello. Yeah, Hello. I am. Everybody, I'm trying, it, it's crazy. We, mute. Everyone us. else, please mute your mics now. There should be no one with an open mic but Mr. Barber. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Dana. Um, hello all, and I thank you all for coming out tonight to see and hear those true, the, from those truly impacted by all the plans and actions that NYCHA has been pushing. My name is Daniel Barber, and I am the president of the Andrew Jackson Houses, as well as the Citywide Council of Presidents Chairman. 
also referred to as CCOP. CCOP is the jurisdiction-wide body of elected resident leaders on the citywide level. Under federal law, 24 CFR 964 HUD regulations, which governs the residents' associations, as well as NYCHA, gives us rights and rules for us to follow. In the regulation 24 CFR 964.135, it states, residents shall be involved and participate in the overall policy and development of public housing operations. The CCOP has not been at the table as referred to by Mr. Toppin to help draft, create, and we're surely not supporting this blueprint plan or the RAD transformations, which are truly cosmetic uh, attractions. For it's a new beginning and a new start, and we the residents are standing up to the bureaucracy to say that we're tired and will no longer continue to be pawns and the sacrifices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Barber. We will now move on to our next panel member from CAV. Will you please unmute your mic? and introduce yourself. Uh, 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 good evening, residents uh, and government workers. Government workers. I am Mr. Zhang a member of the Asian Tenant Union. Live, uh, I live in uh, I live public, in, uh, public housing in Queens. We are the Asian Tenant Union. We are the Asian Tenant Union. We are the Asian Tenant Union. We are Asian Tenant Union uh, was established in 2016. Um, its purpose is to help uh, low income um, residents to express their voice and demands. Um, to assist, um, to assist um, um, communication to communication the government, to the and, government work toward and work toward safety and, safety um, and better, um, health safety better health condition in the community. Uh, Regarding the privatization of public housing uh, trusts, all members of the um, tenant union have concerns.
，政府楼营运维护经费短缺和严重的不不足。Um, because of the miscalculation of、um, NYCHA's funds that's supposed to be allocated to public housing,、um, the, there has been a, a terrible shortage in funds、um, that, it, it, toward public housing. 政府楼希望依靠私人公司转为信托，来弥补政府楼的营运管理和维护资金。嗯、um, ，Public housing， 呃、uh, ，NYCHA was hoping NYCHA hopes to rely on a trust from a privatized company to make um、uh, to make up for its shortage and to manage. And、uh, do maintenance for the building. We Asian Tenant Union、um, represent all tenants. Uh, would like to announce to all members of Congress. First, um, I first do not. Um, do, do not allocate any fund from the city to state、um, to that's a mis、uh, misappropriation of funds、um, to use it for um, um, public housing. 南土和私信托。私有化不管以任何的方式来修改，也改变不了私有化的目的。The purpose of privatization will not be changed by the blueprint or trust. 我们要求政府取消该计划。We demand the government to cancel such plan. If the government becomes a private property, if、um, there's a trust for the public housing, then because the private property is to get a profit. Hey, Zhang Xianzhu, you say it again, okay? Just like you said, it's a repeat. Let's repeat what you said. Because the private company is to get a profit as a result. Because there's a debt, the main goal for the private company is to make profit. We don't want 这一公共住房被私人公司用作赚取利润的工具。We do not want our public housing to become a tool for these private company to make profit. 二，呃，政府楼南呃那个政府楼南土将严重损害政府给予。低收入族群的福利和权益。The NYCHA blueprint will seriously damage the、um, residents' rights. And,、uh, sorry, the NYCHA blueprint will seriously damage low-income people's rights and、um, interests. 并可给贫困居民
They will bring terrible economic burden to low-income people. Especially, especially during the worst time of this pandemic, it's like sprinkle salt onto the wound. It will cause them um, homeless in the end. Such damage and terrible mistake will bring um or make America look it will bring a very negative impact to America's international image. It will also compromise um US democracy, freedom, and human rights. 同时也背离了美国的帝国资本. Uh, at the same time, it's American capitalism. San Third Public housing was established in the 20s and the and 30s after working class people's hard work of protest and difficult efforts. This is generations of working class um, hard work and um, this rights and hard work should not be violated. Especially during, especially facing the uh, serious pandemic, putting all people in a um, sort of hot fire Excuse and, me, uh, survival. Excuse me, uh, interpreter. Uh, we are now over 10 minutes. Can you please close out? Okay. Um, 张先生还有要说的吗？他说要您已经到十分钟了。啊，快了，快了，马上到，快了。呃，we're finishing up. We're finishing soon. 尤其在当前的面临最为严重，那个那个私有化，尤其在当前面临最为严重的病毒大流行，是广大住客陷入了生命和生存的危机之中。this trust plan and a blueprint will bring a terrible hit to the livelihood of our us tenants. This is why we are fighting for our rights. Therefore, we stand our ground to defend our um, rights to um, stand against the privatization of public housing. After, for, first, after um, several generations working class hard work and support of from uh, several administrations. Public housing uh, has brought us safety and stable living conditions. Uh, these made our housing affordable and uh, make us, it's a, 
the root of our livelihood. Uh, we must keep this house environmental friendly, affordable, and stable. So um, our us low income group can live in peace and happiness under the care of our government. Uh, fight for America's um, unity and um, a strong nation. Thank you. You okay, did thank you. You okay. did good up. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is from Take Root Justice. Take Root Justice, please unmute your mic. Everyone else, please mute your mic. Uh, so we may we may have a little bit of a challenge. Uh, some of our speakers didn't make it in on time. Um, so I'm gonna see if we can try to get Sophie in from Take Root Justice. Okay. Uh, we, can, we can move on. Okay. Our next speaker on, uh, on our panel would be Ms. Layden Youssef. Is Ms. Youssef available? Mr. Zane, please mute your mic. Okay, hi. Uh -huh. One second. Can you? I'm trying to mute my, okay. my video camera. <laughs> Good evening, Ms. Youssef, and thank you for being Good here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to your town hall meeting. I am I am calling in from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I am really glad to be here with you all. And we are in solidarity of your movement to keep public housing public and to fight the privatization of public housing. Um, I've been asked by your committee members just to kind of do a brief introduction of what our experience has been with Greg Russ, who is the, now the NYSHA chair, when he was running Minneapolis Public Housing here. And I'll go through that and some of the similarities that I've seen with your uh, with the program that he introduced, even though I didn't have a chance to go through all the documents that Marquis sent me, and then what, what our experience has been. So Defend Glendale and Public Housing, Public Housing Coalition began in 2014 uh, and late of 2014 before um, Greg Russ got here to stop the privatization of Glendale townhomes where is where I live. And I know there's an interpreter, so I'm gonna go slow, I apologize. And um, we, we were successful in stopping the RAD application at City Hall in 2016. And then they realized that residents were really organizing. And um, I am actually the co-founder of Defend Glendale Public Housing Coalition. and that's when they brought in Greg Russ and he was running the Cambridge Public Housing Authority in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he was only here for two years from 2017 to 2019 before he came to NYSHA. Uh, so I can talk about our experience with Greg Russ. Greg Russ is a very charming man um, and his MO is really about PR and changing the view of how the public see public housing. Basically, he wants to push out the public narrative nationally to let people know that public housing is no longer is no longer needed and it's obsolete. The word obsolete is something that he favors um, to use a lot. Um, he wants the mainstream and the public housing residents to believe that public housing will eventually end. And basically we don't have a choice but to go with his plans to save public housing, which means privatization plans. Um, prior to coming to MPHA, he has testified in con at Congress to increase the RAT application nationwide to also increase the, uh, the MTW, which is the, the, the program de de that deregulates public housing. And his main thing is that he wants the residents' guards to be down, uh, to to trust him, to make uh, to uh, to make uh, to make the residents feel good about their housing. In turn, while he also brings in the privatization plans. So, for example, he would say, "We will fix your homes, anything you want. We will help you." But then, at the same time, he will try to bring for you this privatization plans through right in section H, section 18, for you to accept. Um, the plans. And so he, he, he 
uh, main main um, tactics. Uh, the other thing that we found is that um, once once he changes the organizational structure um, to implement RAD or Section 18, um, and and he gets the he, he he was able to get the city hall here to vote to trust his plans. Uh, then after two years, which is what he did to us, he'll move on to the next city. Um, he's done that in, in Chicago. He did that in Detroit, in Philly, in Cambridge, in Minneapolis, and now he is in NYSHA. Um, and he was also very close to Carson. So the plans that he pushed in Minneapolis were the Trump on Carson plans. For example, Section 18, which was to demolish and dispose single family homes, which is which we have 730 single family homes in the city of Minneapolis, he used Section 18 because Carson and Trump said that any public housing authority that wants to use Section 18, they can do so. Where before Trump, it was very restricted and it took a long time to allow Section 18 to be implemented. And there were a lot of uh, protections within Section 18. the stock could be could be uh disposed in section in into section 18 so because of that he took the carson and trump plan in minneapolis which is miss laden can i ask you just a little bit slower privatization and the czar of privatization and and, and uh, gentrification sorry oh uh, i just want uh, you so to as you know he also has a I'm sorry. Can you just emphasize okay. the commas and the periods with longer pauses? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, once he changes the organizational structure, like what he's doing right now with NYSHA, from uh, with the with the plans from uh, stabilization strategy, transformation, and jobs. His main plan is to do that first, and then after that, to bring in staff or people or people that are. Um, friendly to his plans and after that to try to uh, bring in that is when he will introduce basically the details of the privatization schemes such as section 18 rad how many buildings will go first and so forth and so on i hope i'm going slow i apologize um and so that is that is that's basically the outline of what he plans to do what he has done with us that he went to the city hall he pushed the plans and then they bought it in and they and Minneapolis is a very racist city so public housing residents have been really segregated and marginalized in terms of them being at the table and we a lot of the plans that he's he, he has been he has got the um the city to endorse and the nonprofits which has been in bed with him um we were not aware of and when we found out is when we would begin protesting calling him out exposing the plans and educating the residents of how these plans will be uh, will end in displacement and and getting and basically ending public housing as it is miss layton um, i have to ask you a question um in, in, in your explanation can you just briefly give us a uh, a, a, a brief on the situation I, can you give us a brief on the 22 apartments that Mr. Russ claims that he added to that development where there were tenants that came out of those developments and were promised to have those apartments. I think I'm getting, you're getting cut off and I don't know if it's my internet, but can it's you put your it in internet. the chat? Okay, I'll can put you, it in the um, chat. I'm sorry, Ms. Dana. Um, can you put the question in the chat? I'm having a problem with my internet real quick. Would you be able to put the question in the chat and I can answer that? Yes, she's going to put it in the chat for you. Okay, so I'll move on to the next part that I can share with you. I can just, I will quickly share with you. I hope it works. Okay, Belinda, we have a group of, uh, they join our session. Oh, okay. Um, let me see if I can share. Would you be able to, okay, that I share something with you? Like just a, a PowerPoint real quick to show the plans that he introduced? Yes, I'm going to make you a co-host right now, and I should allow you to do so. Okay. Let me see if it works. Oh. I should give it a search your name. Why can I find it? Okay, here we go. And I'm going to make you a co-host. There you go. You should be able to share now. Okay. Let me see if it let me. My computer's kind of... Okay, so let me see if I can do this. Do you guys, do you, do you all see this pathway to preservation PowerPoint? 
It's still loaded, but it's up. Oh, okay. Let me see if you if you there see you it. Go. Yes. Okay. So this is this is what he introduced when he first moved here, and and basically because we are really not even a quarter of your public housing, and he's talking about how we need to um, basically. Uh, we have 26,000 people. Um, we are ranked as high performer. So repairs were never really an issue here in terms of there are some, of course we have repair problems, but it's not to the extent that, that other cities have because we're a smaller group. And I just wanna jump, I wanna jump, and y'all can, I'll share this, you guys can keep this. I wanna jump to page 10. He's basically showing how Congress is losing funding and so forth, but I wanna show the important part of it um let me see one second this is where he explains the tax credits and it looks like it's kind of similar to your plans but it's a lot shorter okay this is where this is where it's interesting here he talks about the possible ownership structure which is actually what he made it happen he says here that public housing is the landowner and if you see here um, he will create a MPHA apartments or something similar to that where 99.9% .9 will be owned by the tax credit investor member and 0.001% will be owned by MPHA apartments. So basically he'll have MPHA, he, we, we have MPHA that, 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 that has the declaration of trust to look at, to, to manage these homes as public housing through, through HUD. And what he will do is he will create LLC entities and 99% of the building, of that building or buildings that he wants to privatize will, will go to a, a, an investor. And so it looks like to me, that might be what he is doing with the, uh, with the other program that you guys, uh, you guys have, which is the, tr the, tr the trust. And he's trying to bring in um, the investors in that when he transforms the, the homes um, or, or NYSHA from, from the public housing into the, um, into the trust, the public trust. I, don't, I do not think that public trust will be public uh, the way it's never, because if it was, he would just fund NYSHA as public housing. So I'm gonna, um, I will leave this for y'all to look through, but I just wanted to show how he, what he planned to introduce. And for this one, he was able to um let me see i can get out now i think let me see if i can if you're um, trying to stop the share screen they okay, yeah go ahead you. thank you um and so mpaj voted for this and he also introduced something called the guiding principles for redevelopment and investment and it was really tricky with this because basically the city said you guys can go ahead and privatize any homes that you want through rider section 18 and because and they never said in their plans that you are guaranteed that if we privatize building building or or we get rid of units under rider section 18 that we will have a replacement units they said eventually minneapolis public housing authority will create replacement units but there's no guarantee so we kept asking for what makes what will make us believe that you're actually going to keep these homes as public housing or the residents rents will not increase and there was no guarantee in that the other thing that he also lobbied for is something called um, land use restrictive agreement, which is basically right now all the public housing in Minneapolis, and I think maybe it's the same way with NYSHA, it's under declaration of trust, which is public land, and it's the trust of HUD that allows NYSHA to operate these homes as public housing. LORA, land use restrictive agreement, allows investors to come in and to basically uh, take over the properties, manage the properties, run the properties, or, the, or allows the investors to lease the land. So for example, in Minneapolis, he um, what he did was the Elliott Twins, which is the question I think someone had, the Elliott Twins, to answer your question, I think you were asking about the 22 added apartments. There were no 22 added apartments at Elliott Twins. What they did at Elliott Twins is they vacated, they, they never rented 22 units. When people left or, or some of the elders passed on, um, they never rented those homes. They left them vacant on purpose. So there was no proof 
and you can ask him where the proof is. There was no proof. Actually, right now, residents are being slowly moved out of Elliot Twins because Elliot Twins is now has been leased to Royal Bank of Canada for 99 years. Yes. And, and, and 99 years is the lease that they have, and they have an ownership of 99.9%. That is the first building or, or the twins that Greg Ross was able to privatize before he left. And, and while this, he was I, I, leaving. I, I, excuse me, I'm sorry, but Ms. Houston, but I bring this point up because at Greg Russ's many webinars, I asked specifically about this incident, which I read in the paper as an article. And he said, no, we added 22 apartments, which was not well, the case. Yeah, Ms. Dana, you can ask him to give you data request of the addition that he made, and we will show you, we will show you the rebuttal. If you Already done it. I've never gotten it. Never gotten yeah, it. Ask and him I won't to get show it. You the evidence. Okay. Well, so, thank you, Ms. Um, Ms. Yusuf. Um, yeah, I just have like one more, one more, couple more things to say before um before I finish. So it looks like it looks like the stabilization plan may be where he is going to introduce um the uh how to how to raise the capital and and the private developers that will be coming in and uh, and so forth for example um the question is and i don't know this the 40 billion that he's saying or that she's saying that that they need how many years is that for example in minneapolis they said they need 500 million because we're a smaller stock when you have 500 million the narrative that he pushed out was we need 500 million now but what we found out is that they need a 25 million a year in 20 years, which is 500 million. And each year, MPHA has been receiving $15 million only in repair capital. So I'm just talking about the repair. I'm not talking about the whole budget of MPHA. They, only, they, they were receiving 15 million from HUD, right, for repairs. And to make up for the next 10 million that they needed, they could have easily asked the city for city levy. They could have asked the state for funding, but they didn't. They could have also used 23 million surplus that they have been sitting on that has been mismanaged by through high salaries and consultant fees. Now, I think I mentioned Elliot Twins and Rad and the company that he said he created is called Elliot's LLP. He said, which is what he's saying to you, to you all, that Elliot Twins will be managed under public housing and the same board will be managing it. The trick is the board can choose any time that they want to be separate and they could choose new board for that. So that is one of the things that he has. So that board is not going to be forever public housing board. They can choose whatever board, they can choose an investor to come in, they can do whatever they want. There's, they never show any guidelines to us of what this board is about. The other okay, nonprofit Yusuf, that he created. Ms. Yusuf, we have to move on. And I would hope that you stick around for the question and answer segment. I'm quite okay, sure no there'll problem. be some I questions for you. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're um, welcome. Now I'm going to call ahead uh, Ms. Ramona Ferrer. Uh, Ms. Ramona, can you please uh -huh. unmute your mic? Hi, everyone. Um, nice to speak, not type. Uh, thank you so much um, to everyone for coming in tonight. Um, that was a great uh, conversation or testimony that we just heard um, from another sister public housing authority. And yeah. um, what I plan to do um, tonight, I'm going to try to remind myself to slow down. So if at any moment I'm going too fast, if you guys can just do this to me so that I use my commas, which is my weakness. Um, so you should, another point is you should now have the YouTube link and a second Zoom room um, for overflow. I put that in the chat. Uh, so I am going to be sharing some information um, that recognizes that NYCHA is in a crisis. None of us want to live in the conditions that we are currently living, but we do not have to accept the blueprint or RAD as the answers. So what options do we have? 
Um, the first option that is getting uh, spoken a lot about is a congressional bill. The congressional bill is important because the main financial responsibility for NYCHA and all public housing in the United States falls on Congress. So for the last three years, uh, Congressperson Nidia Velasquez has been introducing a bill. My dog doesn't like it very much. <laughs> Brownie, thank you. Um, this bill is House Resolution 4546. Um, some seniors and I worked on a calendar last year because we wanted to bring um, up attention on Capitol Hill and in DC focused on this bill. So the bill does what? It asks Congress to give public housing all across the United States $70 billion. Now that sounds like a lot, but NYCHA alone needs $40 billion because this bill is being um, introduced every single year. They really haven't updated their numbers. So the last version of the bill, which is now being introduced as part of the COVID package, which is smart because COVID is an emergency funding that comes to us because of COVID should be coming to us as an emergency. And we are living in a disaster, right? So Nidia's thinking is really good in saying, well, let me introduce this bill as part of a emergency platform. But that bill is old, right? And it's just been changing its date. So that bill only gives NYCHA $32 billion and it spreads the rest of the money all over the United States. So anywhere that there is public housing, we'll have to split the rest of the money. I'm not a math magician, so 70 billion minus 32 billion. That's what the rest of the country gets. Now, what does that 32 billion do for NYCHA? It is going to bring NYCHA to code. What does code mean? One of the reasons that the blueprint has made such an impact and ripples at the state and city level is that the blueprint talks about something called obsolescine. It's a really funky word. It means that your apartment is not inhabitable. So if your apartment becomes uninhabitable for humans, you become an obsolescent unit. NYCHA, because of the neglect that we've seen, the mismanagement that we've seen, the corruption that we've seen, and the federal lack of funding has become obsolescent. So, Mr. Russ is saying to Congress, to HUD, to the state and the city, NYCHA is obsolescent. Look at this mess. Look at Ramona's apartment. She has a leak from the roof that we've been trying to fix for seven years. She can't live there. She shouldn't have to live there. So my unit, because of that, because of lead, because of our faulty elevators, all of these things that have been getting neglected make a perfect formula. And that formula means that our homes are not worthy of us living in them. Now we know that, right? Not one of us here is happy with the way that we're living, but he's using that as the reason to push forward the blueprint. Nydia's bill will help us NYCHA actually bring apartments to code. Code is defined really tightly when it comes to HUD. Exactly, Doug, intentional neglect. So for the last year, we've been living with COVID. What does NYCHA tell you when you say, I need paint? COVID. 
I need you to plaster, COVID. I need you to fumigate, COVID. My trash isn't getting picked up, COVID. There's a rats in my lobby, COVID. So they have been using the history and COVID to neglect our apartments. Now we're not meeting code. We have lead, we have mold, our elevators are faulty, our seniors are not living um, with good breathing capabilities, right? Your walls are leaking in air, your windows are not maintaining your apartment warm or cool. So he's using this vulnerability against us. Now we need and understand that $34 billion is not something you say no to. So what we say is, sure, give me the $34 billion, but, and it's in that but that things get interesting, right? Because never before has NYCHA as a community been this activated and this together. So the but is, you need to bring our units up to code, but that's not enough. You need to honor section nine, which the blueprint gets rid of. You need to make sure that we have community investments, which the blueprint doesn't keep. You need to make sure that our resident leadership is getting trained, supported, and developed, which the blueprint stops. So under the blueprint, we lose section nine. If you are not an existing resident organization, you are not allowed to form a new one. Existing resident organizations do not continue, will not continue. Think back 10 years ago when resident engagement was dope and we had programming and we had education and we had the things that needed to happen in order for us to have upward mobility. Why are public housing residents not getting upward mobility? Because the core of living in a HUD public housing development is that you are given certain rights. Those rights include being represented by a peer through just elections. Those rights include the development of not only resident leadership, but all residents. So it includes senior activities. It includes youth activities. It includes educational activities and opportunities. And I don't wanna get into the section regarding contractors cause that's, that's too much, I'll get sweaty. So that's Nydia's bill, right? That's one option. That option again, we'll take it in singles quarters or dimes, however you want to drop it off, drop it off. But in addition to making sure that you give us um, the actual representation and support that we need, we demand more, right? So what is that more? What are the options for more? And for that, I'll go ahead and I'll pass it to Arthur who just popped in and he is from Sunrise NYC. And Arthur can talk to you guys about, um, Arthur, are you here? Can you unmute? Another vision, um, which again, allows us to take Nydia's um, bill, but then do more. So, <laughs> shh, brownie. So Arthur can't um, speak. So he's asking me to take over the, the sunrise portion. So, so the bill number for Nidia Velasquez is four, three, oh, five, six. Sorry, four, five, four, six. And on Sundays, the residents to preserve public housing get together every Sunday, three to five. Marquis is um, always facilitating that. And we have been focused up to this point 
um, on the blueprint and making sure that every resident that shows up understands the blueprint. But we'll be talking about Nydia's bill in more detail in the coming weeks and months, right? Because it's important that we get this money. So the additional Zoom meeting shouldn't have a password. It should just be open. Um, it's mine, so it should let you in. So the second part of this is Sunrise NYC, which is known as part of the large Sunrise organization. Um, they and the Movement School, which is an organization that trains folks to become politically active, came hey, together. Uh, hey, Arthur. Yay. <laughs> Arthur's hey. here. I can stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> what, so a they wild, came together. what a wild day. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Yeah, patient. and Arthur's going to explain to you the Green New Deal now. Thank you so much, Ramona. Fantastic. Um, may I go ahead, Marquise? Yes, but Dana is your, uh, the person you uh, respond to. Fabulous. Okay. Dana, may I go ahead? Yes, go ahead, Arthur. Your start you, time is 7.13. Okay, and how many, and I have three minutes? Uh, I'm going to give you 10 minutes since that's what everybody else has taken. Okay, I don't know if I'll use it, but I can use the rest for questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Happy Wednesday. My name is Arthur. I use he, him pronouns, and I am part of an organization called Sunrise Movement New York. Chat for me, please. Um, and I also work with an organization called Movement School. If you've heard of Movement School, would you put an, an exclamation mark in the chat, please? So why so um let me tell you about let me tell you a little bit about um what we are fighting for so i i come from a background of fighting for climate justice and if you look at new york city um if you want to upwards of 70 percent of emissions in new york city come from housing come from buildings now why does that matter well if we want to solve the climate crisis and make sure that things like Sandy don't happen again, which the climate crisis will always hurt um, people who live in public housing more than people in fancy rich apartments on the Upper West Side, um, then improving NYCHA and getting NYCHA into the, uh, the quality of life and the quality of buildings that it deserves needs to happen for us to address climate change. And vice versa, um, if you care about NYCHA, you also have to care about the climate crisis because it is only because um, of the ch of increase in temperatures, increase of extreme weather um, like Sandy, that there is constant mold in NYCHA, that there is, uh, that there is uh, terrible heating and cooling right? These are partially because of the climate crisis. So this is all to say that if you care about the climate crisis, you have to care about improving NYCHA. And if you care about in improving NYCHA, you have to care about the climate crisis. Okay, so that was really high level. Let me get specific. Um, the, there is currently a bill that has already been written by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Bernie Sanders that was introduced or it's about to be introduced into Congress in a, a, about a month or so. Um, it was going to be released just a couple weeks ago, but the impeachment has slowed things down and pushed things out. Um, that is called the Green New Deal for Public Housing. Um, the Green New Deal for public housing would be the largest investment in public housing since its creation in 1934. That means that if, if I know, I know a lot of the people on this call have been in public housing, your families have been in public housing for a, for a long time. If, if your families have been in public housing since the 50s, 40s, 50s, or 60s, would you put a, a one word description in the chat of what public housing was like back then compared to now. It was probably more community. It was probably better preserved. It was probably safer. Um, and because of the disinvestment of the last 40 years, which is intentional, right? Because 
politicians want to ignore and push off public housing and say, oh, we don't have to deal with that. That's, pardon my language, but that's bullshit. And what this bill does, the Green New Deal for public housing, is it will invest in to create, make sure that NYCHA is like it was in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Right. And what I mean to say is that it is not what the blueprint does is give superficial improvements. Right. It, it may replace your dishwasher. It may replace your fridge, but it's not going to invest in you as a person, as a tenant. It takes away your rights to organize. What the blue Green New Deal for public housing does is it invests billions, hundreds of billions of dollars into uh, creating community spaces again that can be utilized and safe. It puts money into the uh, creating new energy efficient systems in place. So you know how if you're on the first floor or on the 17th floor of a NYCHA building, your experience with heat and cooling will be entirely different. Maybe the radiators are too hot to the touch. I imagine some people here have had their legs or their kids have been burned on the radiators. Right, or maybe it's so hot in the winter or summertime you can barely even be in your apartment. This is because that these were the best systems when they were built in the 30s or 40s. Um, however, um, thank you, Emhe. I appreciate you. Um, however, now it is these are terribly outdated systems. Um, and so let me, let me say one cool thing. This is kind of nerdy and fun, so stay with me. I promise I'll get to a good point here. Um, what the Green New Deal for public housing does is it will uh, improve, uh, completely retrofit, which just means like deeply improve and invest a ton of money into all of the public housing across the entire country, including New York City. And because there's such high scale, because there is so many public housing units in the United States, public housing can put money into new uh, appliances, new machinery and new inventions that otherwise would take decades to create. But because, so for, like, if you're gonna build say super high quality energy efficient stoves that are safe to touch, safe to use and don't use almost any energy, those, if you have a factory that make 10 a year, it's pretty expensive. But what public housing can do is build 100,000 new stoves a year um, and it decreases the cost of those stoves. So it means that the best quality appliances, machinery can be made at a very low price because you're producing so many of them. So. That was kind of nerdy, but I just wanted to say like that when you do something at a really large scale, like the Green New Deal for public housing, you're actually able to give more improvements and better quality um, infrastructure than you could if it was a smaller investment. So I'm going to say one last thing here. Um, the Fantastic, Dana. Give me one minute and I will wrap up. So I think that there's, first of all, uh, our team is not for anything that will privatize public housing. We saw what happened with RAD, with PAC, and now the blueprint is trying to do the same thing. I see you, Aisha, uh, you know that, that you are an elder of mine and you know better than anyone that we are not about to put, throw our beautiful communities away to bad privatization plans. However, we should not be trapped into thinking that we have to only take Nydia's bill or the Green New Deal for public housing. That is a false dichotomy. We can have both, right? Nydia's bill has been released for the past three years and it will invest the same amount, 34 billion into New York City. That number was created three years ago. So guess what? That number is not big enough anymore. We need more money in New York City. And that's just to get up to code. Isn't that crazy? So what Nydia, Nydia's bill does is it almost, not quite, but almost gets New York City back up to code. That means no more broken elevators. That means no more broken heat. But what it does not do, 
what Nidia's bill does not do is invest in the long-term quality of living in public housing. It does not bring back community centers. It does not bring back beautiful lawns outside of NYCHA that right now are fenced off. What a shame. It does not bring back uh, actual quality of life, beautiful apartments, new high quality appliances into NYCHA developments. You know what does do that is the Green New Deal for public housing. And those two bills together would bring New York City and all of the public housing across the country back to the quality and the vibrancy that was here when it was first created before it was destroyed by racist and classist politicians. Um, so Dana, I appreciate you giving me the time. We meet every Monday at 8 p.m. Um, we have beautiful tenants on this phone that join all the time, like Robert Hall, like Ramona, and I would be more than happy to have any of you join us. Um, uh, I'm sure that on the email that we'll send after, Marquise will do me the honor of being able to include the Zoom link to our Monday Monday calls, so you will get our information. Thank you all very much. Ab absolutely, uh, and if you want, go ahead and drop it in the chat box. I will be sending out a follow-up email to everyone and they'll include that, but Fantastic. please, send it in the chat now. now. Thank you, Marquise. Thank you, Arthur. Now we are going to move on to our next segment, uh, which is called The Ask. And first we will have Mr. Robert Hall, who will, rep will present our residents to preserve public housing's demands for Ms. our Dana. elected officials and ask Ms. for their response. Ms. Dana, uh, if I can just pause just for a second, I do wanna take maybe 10 minutes uh, for some Q and A uh, for some of our panelists. I know maybe some of our um, participants have a question. Uh, I, know <laughs> I know that one of our participants may have a question. So uh, maybe we can just take 10 minutes to answer some questions. Okay, can we first go back to Ms. Yusuf who yes. has, has her hand up first? Ms. Yusuf, on oh, you. Sure. you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Hi. <laughs> okay. Can you? I just wanted to kind of finish my point about about Greg Russ and the plans that he had in Minneapolis and and what we're trying to damage that he caused that we are now trying to clean up. And the first thing that I wanted to say about the last panel is that we are all for the green the Green New Deal, but the issue we have is. We have to first stop the privatization that's happening right now at the local level, because if we don't stop it, there will be nothing left for us to save when, when, when the Green New Deal hits, hits us or other cities. So it's, uh, it's the local officials that have the power right now mm -hmm. to stop the damage that Greg Russ did and the damage that he's about to do in New York City. So I just wanted to say that one. Two, it's also really important. We, as a, I've been, I'm, my background is in community organizing leadership development, and I'm a public housing resident since 2004. And it is difficult when residents are being told so many different stories by MPHA and by others, and they are just being overwhelmed. And it's also the stress that it causes for them in terms of the health that they, the health, um, the, uh, especially residents that are, are, have health issues and what RAD and the privatization schemes does to them. And also the, the health of the residents have to be considered into how this is impacting them because these programs lead into uh, displacement. The important point that I wanna talk about is tenant, uh, the tenant project, uh, protection voucher. What we have seen is that the tenant protection voucher, vouchers, there's no guarantees in the leases that, that, that the residents are being forced to sign under section 18 or RAD that says the rents will be 30% of income. 30% of income will be your rent. There's no guarantee, which is another way to privatize, another way to raise the rents and push residents out when they can't afford it. So resident organizing is key. It has been key for us, but it's also the challenges where we have to convince residents in terms of to see that their homes are at risk. So we've had challenges where Greg Russ tried to silence residents, but we're still overcoming that and our movement is building citywide. The other thing is that I wanted to say that's really important is that you, you guys have a good chance right now to stop this um, and, and to stop Greg Russ's plans because that's really what's important before he moves on to, to change the structure of NYSHA where he will bring in the privatization schemes. Because if that happens, then where does the Green New Deal come in? 
And what's going to happen? Because developers are going to be taking over these homes at some point, and they will be the ones who will dictate the, the process. So I just wanted to end it with that. Our goal at Defend Glendale and Public Housing Coalition is to keep public housing public and to build more public housing in Minneapolis. And it has to start at the local level for us. And that has been our challenge. And that is what we're overcoming now. So I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I can answer. Marquise, I'm going to hand it over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, let me see. I think we have time for maybe two questions. I mean questions. I mean questions because I know we got a hundred, at least a hundred experts on this call. So if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please raise your hand. We got time for two. I'm looking and looking. Uh, call facilitators, if you see something that I don't, please call them out. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Brenda Temple. I live in Oceanside in Far Rockaway, Queens. I'm a member of Committee for Independent Community Action with Dr. Lenora Falani, community activist. And um, I wanted to know, I live in public housing. I live across the street from an already rad privatized development called Ocean Bay. And somebody else is on the uh, call today, and she will tell you the horror story as a result of that conversion. But um, the other lady was saying that she did have some type of solution to this problem where we can keep public housing public and not have to um, compromise with the, the privatization and all these plans they have coming up. What is What are your ideas? What do you think a solution is? And I'm ready well, to Ramona, march. I'm a march, Ramona, I'm a protester, I'm a rallier. Let's yeah, get busy. I'm gonna, Thank Ramona, you. can you take this one, please? Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so I think that the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that all of our neighbors understand that the blueprint is a proposal for privatization. So we want to welcome and encourage everyone to come to our Sunday meetings, because if we can get you the information on the blueprint, we can also support you in writing testimony contacting your elected officials. We have draft letters, we have draft emails. We have volunteers from Sunrise NYC that will also help you write an op-ed and help us get that published. So we have all of these tools that are at your disposal, right? So the first thing is to get our neighbors to understand the threat that the blueprint represents. The second thing. Uh, do you have a plan, plan other than letting our neighbors know and um, you know, having them, of course, uh, say no, halt the blueprint. Yeah. But do you have a plan in place that we can present to the powers that so-called be an, an alternative plan? Sure. Well, I'm can, getting there. Ramona, <laughs> Ramona, can I just jump in? I mean, I, I love I that you question. I, I love that question because it gives me the opportunity to throw the ball back in your court. What we are saying to NYCHA is that you cannot create a plan without us. And so what we are doing in turn is we are uniting to come up with the plans ourselves. So when you ask us, do we have an alternative plan? I'm throwing that ball back at you to ask you, what are your ideas? You are the resident, you are the expert. Ultimately, you're gonna to have to live with that decision. So what are your ideas? And bring them to our Sunday meetings. As Ramona said, we meet every Sunday from three to five and we are strategizing so that we can tell our elected officials and put together the resident plan for public housing. And I would add to that, that the education is required, right? Before we all start stomping and hitting the streets, we do have to come up with a solution. But where we are right now is that we understand that Nydia's bill needs to be passed. So in 2018, I organized seniors in the South Bronx to try to do just that. So we can decide on a Sunday, that needs to be our next step. Then the next layer is, what do you want the future of public housing in New York City to look like. And for me personally, I am not speaking for any organization or group. I believe that the Green New Deal is how we get there. So then we decide as a group who wants to support the Green New Deal. 
And then there is also the infrastructure and the support necessary so that every single tenant that decides that the Green New Deal gives them the future that they want can become informed, mm -hmm. trained, and ready to advocate on behalf of the Green New Deal um, at Washington, right? Because Nydia's bill is going before Congress and the Green New Deal for public housing and the larger Green New Deal will go before Congress and the Senate. And Bernie, who is all green all the time, <laughs> now managing the Senate, um, sorry, my phone is in the other room, the Senate committee that would be responsible to pass the Green New Deal. So we have never had such a good chance to get to code with Nydia's bill, right? So if I, if I was told, give me marching orders, let's organize for Nydia's bill and then let's get the Green New Deal. And that can happen with this new Congress, this new Senate and this new president. But it has to be, you know, we start from a place from education because I would hate to tell people, you need to choose this path or make this selection without you knowing what you're signing up for. And I would caution you to never sign up for anything that you don't fully understand. Because May each I of us one? has housing and human rights that we need to understand for ourselves and then we need to fight for and apply to what we're fighting for. Thank you. And that is a great question uh, to transition us into our next and final piece of this agenda. We have people joining us in. The residents have had an opportunity to speak. And now we wanna hear from our elected officials. And to get us started, I am gonna pass the baton on to our very own Mr. Robert Hall. Okay, uh, can you hear me Marquise? Yes, sir, we hear okay. you loud and clear. First of all, I wanna thank everyone who's on this call. If you're on the telephone, wherever you are, you with the sound of this voice, thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. Now we're going to talk about what do we want? And I'm getting right to the meat and potatoes. We are asking our elected officials to publicly denounce any legislation that would implement the trust noted within the blueprint proposal. That's number one. Number two, we would like for you to communicate your support by halting all legislative and judicial adoption of the blueprint for change directly to NYCHA, the Federal Monitor, and HUD. Number three, and this is very important. We demand a comprehensive audit to be conducted of each housing authority development to see what is necessary to bring that development up to code. Vitally important. I just wanna say for five months, letters were exchanged with Chairman Greg Russ, but he chose to ignore our requests for further participation in the planning process. Because of decades of disinvestment and mismanagement, and I really mean mismanagement, and a good case in point, we need all of this money, but they had the nerve to come up with a no smoking policy which nobody has been trained to enforce. That's a typical example of mismanagement, all right? But this mismanagement by NYCHA, along with the high incidence of COVID-19 deaths amongst our residents and resident leadership, NYCHA residents need additional time and resources to better understand how the blueprint or any proposed change will impact our lives. So 
So please keep that in mind. I have a list of elected officials who put in for this call. I don't know if they're on. I'll go through some names, but these are the people that we really want to help us in achieving our goal. All right? Yes. May I just add um, to what Mr. Hall just said? If you are not on the list, um, when we go through and exhaust the list, we will call on you and ask you uh, to speak up and tell us who you are and what your response are to our demand. Okay, that being said, I'm gonna go through this list very slowly. Yadanis Rodriguez, Rafael Salamaca, Amanda Septimo. That's me. I'm glad to see you. All right, and since I'm looking right at you, I wanna give you a minute for you to take into consideration our demands and give us your thoughts, please. The floor is sure. yours. Of course. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Septimo. I'm the assembly person representing the 84th Assembly District, which is areas like Mott Haven, Port Morris. So a lot. So Mitchell, I know there's a million Mitchell people in here. Hey, Mitchell. Um, and Patterson and Adams and Jackson and Melrose and more houses and Patterson it over and over and over. It's a long list. Um, and I'm so happy to see you all here. Um, I'm not in support of the blueprint. Um, I've been really vocal about that. I've joined some of these meetings before. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it is worth waiting and doing what's right instead of rushing into something. I think NYCHA oftentimes develops these plans that a, don't include residents. And so you're so that I'm clear, I've had this same conversation with Chairman Russ expressing my concerns with the blueprint and why I think it shouldn't move forward. Um, I think NYCHA develops these plans because it's in a tough spot. And like, that's just the reality, right? Like there are a lot of needs. We've heard them all talked about today. There are a lot of, um, sorry, I'm watching this chat. There are a lot of needs, but ultimately there's not a desperation here that makes people want to rush into something bad. And I think that that's what we've seen happen with RAD. That's what we're seeing happen with the blueprint, trying to exploit desperation to get us on a path where public housing is not going to remain public and we're not guaranteed that it will stay that way. Um, I'm really uncomfortable with anything that opens the door to public housing not staying public. I'm really uncomfortable with anything that makes it so that you know, there isn't the guarantee. Um, someone mentioned the guarantee of the 30% of your rental income. Guarantee that we're not going to see evictions go up like we did under RAD. Guarantee that we're not going to see, you know, debt get called in and then the city loses the, the land or the building because of it. Um, those are all things that are unclear. Um, guarantees around accountability for the board. Who's managing who? Who's in charge? Whose fault is it when something goes wrong? Because inevitably things go wrong. Um, and so those are all things that I think are, are really important and haven't been settled here. Um, and I've been really clear about that and my concerns. And frankly, you just can't, you can't make a plan for 600,000 people in the city um, without starting with them. And I think that's the biggest fault of the biggest fault of every part of the blueprint is that it was started without tenants. Um, and so count on me to support and I'm happy to be here as a partner in every step of the way. And, and the last thing I'll say, when the assembly had that hearing, it was in December, it was in the middle of COVID. Everybody was living a crazy life the way we have all year. There wasn't enough time, there wasn't enough publication. Every single um, resident, I tuned into the hearing. I wasn't part of the assembly yet because I just joined in January, but I did tune into the hearing. Every single resident that spoke at that hearing was against the blueprint, every single resident. And I'm sure that there are people here from organizations that are interested in NYCHA. If your organization was supportive of the blueprint, I hope that after that hearing, you are reconsidering because every single tenant spoke against the blueprint. And there are a lot of great organizations who have a lot of credibility and who lend credibility to this plan to the detriment of, of tenants. Uh, and I've had that conversation in meetings with organizations that have met with me to say, you heard everything that tenants had to say, are you still supporting the blueprint? And I think that's something that we all need to continue to do with, the, with these organizations and understand that you can't mean well for NYCHA tenants um, when you're just disagreeing with them on what's right for them. So okay. count all me right. as a partner. Thank you, Ms. Septima. Thank you very much. 
All right. Let me continue this list. And if you're here, please don't hesitate. Uline Neyu. Vanessa Gibson. Buddy, uh, sorry to interrupt. It's uh, Peter. I'm here on behalf of Assemblymember News Office. I, I, is, uh, I hope everybody's doing fine. Um, you know, I just want to let you guys know, yes, we definitely stand with you guys. Uh, we are not uh, for the blueprint. Um, we want to make sure that our residents' voices are heard. Uh, you know, how NYCHA's plan out was, you know, frankly, uh, disturbing, right? They did it, like, at the late of the summer, late summer. They were just like, you know, this blueprint comes out of no residents are telling us, you know, we haven't heard about the plan, like what's going on, like they haven't had enough time to digest it. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, the, the public trust itself is also very opaque. Uh, the leadership, uh, there, there's almost no accountability there. Um, so we just want to make sure that our residents' voices are heard. You know, we're with you guys. Oh, so I represent, or assembly members, it's the 65th Assembly District in Lower Manhattan. Uh, we also have one of our uh, absolutely amazing tenant presidents here, President uh, Torres of Smith Houses. So I just want to give her a shout out. She's absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, we're with you guys. We're a partner for you. So please let us know if there's anything else we can do. Okay. I thank you very much for that support. And please spread the word. All right. Uh, once again, Vanessa Gibson, is she in the house? <laughs> All right, Dario Quinsack, Stefani Zinnerman. I think Rosalba Rodriguez was at least on the phone, if I remember correctly. But if you can hear, yeah, go ahead. Um, I think my was turned around. But okay, good evening, everyone. How are you? My name is Stephanie Zinnerman, and I am the assembly person for the 56th Assembly District representing Bedford Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. Can you all hear me? I'm on a, another Zoom. Okay. We're good. Yes. Very good. Good to see yes. you, um, uh, um, Amanda. Um, uh, to all gathered today, my colleagues in government, the organizers of this event, and of course, the NYCHA residents. Um, uh, please know that I am a daughter of Gowanus Houses. Um, I grew up there, and if I was still living there, I would be standing shoulder to shoulder with you in uh, opposition to the blueprint, um, but I certainly do so in my new position. Um, I have over 30 uh, developments in my um, district um, with Sumner, Marcy, and Tompkins, and Albany, and Kingsboro being some of the largest. Um, and, and so there are a number of things that, of course, you all know um, is wrong with this um, blueprint. Um, but the number one thing for me is I don't believe that anything, um, nothing, you know, the saying nothing um, for us without us um, applies in this particular case. Um, anytime that you want to have a conversation about someone's life and their future, they should have a seat at the table. That is my creed, and that is one of the other reasons why I'm not supporting this particular bill. When I think about, um, you know, some of the waste and some of um, just the ne overwhelming neglect that has happened over time with bad decision making, you know, it really, it really makes me angry. Um, I think, you know, Residents know what they need. Um, when we had centralized services where um, tenant patrols and, and residents were, were the porters and the maintenance people and taking care of um, the places where they lived, we had, you know, it was a better living environment. Now that everything is decentralized and in, well centralized in one place, you know, these, um, the disrepair has um, continued. So I want to um, close out by just saying you certainly can count on me for you know ongoing support and lending my voice um, to the opposition. Um, I agree with Ms. Septimo in, in that you know sometimes uh, not sometimes a lot of times uh, you know agencies uh, get in a pinch and so they don't know what to say so they just put something together based on some ideas that they Googled. Um, but we know that you all know the best and they need to talk to you and they need to talk to the other elected officials in um, the districts to come up with a plan. I believe that also um, we need to look at, if we're gonna talk about privatization, then the only people they need to be selling to are the residents themselves. 
Um, and so there are a number um, uh, of models that we can look at um, to secure that as well. And um, I certainly will stand with you as well to demanding um, a comprehensive audit, but I can almost tell you right now, um, when I look at um, the Russ's proposal to model this after SEA, an agency that I have a lot of problems with, um, that I know that this, this budget is overblown um, and it's not going to do well for the NYCHA residents. So count me in and thank you all for inviting me this evening. And I'll okay. put my information. Thank in. you, Ms. Zimmerman. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Rosalba Rodriguez, Diana Aiello. That would be yeah. me, Councilmember Ayala. How are you? How are you? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for uh, for hosting us tonight and for this very informative town hall. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really proud of you all for really, you know, organizing in this way. I don't think that I've seen this level of organization in quite some time, and I'm really proud of you um, all for really taking this endeavor on. I know it's been a very challenging year, and on top of everything that we're going through, I think that the last thing that we needed was you know, a last ditch effort to save public housing in a way that didn't really include the voices of the public housing residents. I grew up in Lillian Wald houses in the Lower East Side. My, my family still has the same apartment that we moved in when I was nine years old. Um, so I remember, I remember how nice it, it felt to, you know, to live in that apartment and, you know, how, how uh, we would get, you know, new paintings every five years and you know, we would get new cabinets and refrigerators and stoves. And, and, I, and I look at the state of public housing now and I worry. I worry every single night because sometimes, you know, we walk into apartments where people are living in really deplorable uh, conditions. And that really deserves us to really take a real comprehensive look at the state of public housing and to come up with a solution to ensure that people are living in dignified housing. However, um, I think that this uh, blueprint um, is just one more in a list of, of ideas that NYCHA has continued to you know, come to us uh, as the salvation for public housing. Um, I've lived through quite a few of them right now. I no longer trust in that process. I will not support the blueprint. I stand with the residents um, and I, will, I am happy to publicly say that. I am also a member of the public housing committee in the city council. I would happily support you there as well. I think that every, anything that happens in public housing has to be, uh, the, the residents should be leading the conversations or at least sitting at the table um, and helping to come up with solutions. But I do think that a solution has to, you know, we, we do have to sit at the table and come up with an idea because we can't just say no to, to this and not really start planning and thinking about what, what, what our ask is. Um, but I stand with you and thank you all for having me. Thank you very much, Councilwoman, okay. Luis Sepulveda, Carolyn Maloney, Denise Washington, Sam Schachter, Diane, okay, Sam Schachter, Jimmy Van Buren, Van Bremer, I'm sorry, Thomas Blanksero, Staten Island. Isabel Chandler, Nakia Valentine, Frederick Klein, Eileen Scheel, Alexander Marion, Taylor Ebruzis, Peaky Tenzin. And last but not least, Hennessy Reyes. Now, how was I not at it? And I actually joined the calls on Sunday. That's well, what I, I want to know. I stand corrected, but you, you sure don't have the floor. Uh-uh, Marquis. I, 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 take full, I take full responsibility. Yeah. I gave you. Robert the list, so okay. I apologize. All right, so I've been following because that's been my job. You, um, there, there were people that were not mentioned who actually said they support us. Carmen De La Rosa, she got off. Margaret Chin, that are supporting us. Um, I, you know, part of the problem has been that we apologize, Miss Jackson. I give you the floor. Yeah, 
But Miss Jackson, you can talk. You have the floor. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate you. Uh, I am Assembly Member Chantel Jackson. I represent the 79th District. Shout out to all my tenant leaders who are here and who are actually a part of that call every Sunday and my staff who's a part of that call on Sundays. Um, I have at least 20 NYCHA developments in my district. So this, of course, it affects me greatly. I live uh, in Concourse Village and I'm surrounded by three NYCHAs right here. So we have um, constant communication about the things that are wrong, the things that we need to fix. We need a solution. We need one ASAP. However, we need a solution that includes us, right? The people who are directly affected by uh, by 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 the, the end that we have. Um, not sure whose uh, phone that is. But... Please mute your phone, please. Go ahead, Ms. Jackson. Yeah, no problem. So, you know, uh, just the other day, I had my staff go out because we have a we had an outage on the floor for two weeks and they couldn't find light bulbs just for that. So yes, we have a serious problem that we need to address. Um, I've been standing with you from the beginning, uh, opposing this blueprint. I also have had a meeting with uh, Chairman Russ and I asked my NYCHA development uh, individually, what questions do you want me to ask him? I sent him that list of questions and asked some of them while we were in the meeting and I'm waiting for him to get a response to me uh, uh, from those questions. Danny Barber was definitely included in that because I, um, I get to represent Andrew Jackson houses where he lives. Um, and so I did submit those questions. I'm waiting for them to come back. When they come back, I will have a town forum where we can have more conversations specifically about the 7th district, but ultimately everyone will be invited. Um, so yes, you have my support. You've been having my support. Uh, we do need a solution. So I, I'm not about I'm not about complaining about stuff. I'm really about that work. What are we gonna do to get us out of this hole that we're in? So that's what we have to start talking about moving forward. What are we going to do to get out of this hole? So thank you all. Okay, thank you, Miss Jackson. And I'll apologize also because this is not a puppet show, but I really appreciate you know your 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 honor. Okay. And uh, we're going to talk and continue having your individuals be on our Sunday calls is very important. So thank you. Thank you very much. I am always here, Ms. Mr. Hall. I'm always there. So don't okay. worry about that. Not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, last but not least, is there, is there anyone else who felt neglected and that's an elected official that I need to apologize for? I'll do it. But I want to thank all of the can elected I, I'm officials. I'm sorry, Robert, can I, just, can I just add that Vanessa Gibson's staff was on the line and still may be on the line. So I just want to point that out, OK? OK. Is there uh, anyone from Vanessa Gibson's staff on the line? OK. Going hi, once. hi, hi, Mr. Hall. I'm not from Vanessa Gibson's office, but I am from Assembly Member Robert Rodriguez's office. He okay. represents East Harlem, one of the highest concentrations of public housing. Um, we co-lead with uh, the amazing Diana Ayala, and I believe our fearless leader, Ms. Ethel Velez, is also on the call. Um, I just wanted to just put out there that we are hearing you guys loud and clear. Uh, one of the things that, um, the first thing that we've um, are mostly concerned about is the lack of transparency and the lack of uh, information that seems to be available to, frankly, elected officials and um, tenants and the fact that tenants weren't a part of the conversations from the beginning. And so we are um, working to understand the plan, to scrutinize the plan, and um, working with Ms. Velez and others in the community to uh, engage tenants um, to understand what their concerns are and how we can fight back and, and really ensure that whatever decision is made is made alongside tenants. Um, so thank you so much for having um, this call and for inviting us. All right, and thank you for being with us, okay? And um, if you can, you can get someone on our Sunday calls from three to five. Go ahead, sir. Uh, so you're asking for representatives, not uh, not yes. if, even if the elect is not here. Yeah, I work for Carolyn Maloney in Queens, and she's a big supporter of the Green New Deal for NYSHA and Nydia's bill. Uh, we'll find out. I'm not sure of her exact take yet on the uh, blueprint, 
but she's been very involved in working with Queensbridge houses, Ravenswood houses, and Astoria houses and trying to improve the maintenance there. Working with Russ on this thing that's called the um, pilot program for the skilled trades, which is starting to show, well, it's still just being implemented now. Anyway, I want to know, just put in there that she's very supportive of what's going on and the problems in the housing. And obviously he's going to be working on getting the funding in Congress, which is okay. to me such a key. Congresswoman, footnote, Congresswoman um, Maloney also has um, part of her district is part of the Lower East Side. That's I know that. And she has some on the upper, on the upper okay. East Side too. Yeah, no, I know, but I, I, I live in the Lower East Side, so I can tell you we, we neighbor. She neighbor. <laughs> That's all okay. I'm saying. Yes. Just for, well, thank just you. for your think... information. Yep. No, I know that. I just was speaking to Queens because that's the ones that I'm the okay. housing I know the most about. Can yeah. I just add that you also, you guys have a lot of support from um, people who are running. I'm not going to name them because it's a lot of people on here, but I just want you to know you have some city council people who are running for office who are on this call and you they have uh, you have their support support as well. And we don't have to name everybody, but just know that they're here. You can drop your info in the chat if you feel like it. Yes, please do. Please do. And thank That's you. That's right. If you're in the Bronx, I'm sorry, I don't work for an organization, so I can plug. If you are in the Bronx and you are in District 16, you better be voting and supporting my girl Althea Stevens. Uh, she is. <laughs> I, I am plugging. Yeah, I'm plugging. Um, but ain't no power like the power of the people because the power of the people don't stop. Say it with me. Ain't no power like the power of the people because the power of the people don't stop. People don't stop. stop. Amen. Ain't no power like the power of the people because the power of the people don't stop. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry that I missed this meeting. This meeting had to be so powerful because it took me 15 minutes to get into this meeting. And when I went at 6.15 to try to get in this meeting, it knocked me right out and said, over 100 people is already on this meeting. Awesome job. For I'm, I am, my name is Adorn DuBose, and I am the resident association president for Sumner Houses in Brooklyn. And okay. I'm sorry I missed this meeting. That's if okay. If you're happy of this meeting, please send it to me. You can send it to me at Sumner Houses at Mind Springs. Uh-huh. Okay. ADD, I'll, I'll send you the information. And I'll try to finish, you know, while everybody's sending the information, but I'm sorry I missed this meeting. That's okay. And I'll I'm doing I, I, if you in Stat if you in Staten Island and you're looking for someone who's got our back to vote for city council, I'm also calling on my girl Amoy Barnes, who is running for city council in Staten Island. Folks, we need to get our people into city council and into the Mayo. Uh, to be uh, become our mayor. Today, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. This meeting wouldn't been as powerful without all of you signing up and participating. But we also have a dedicated, strong leadership of public housing residents who came together to put this meeting on. As it was mentioned earlier, we meet every Sunday, every Sunday from three to five to plan out our strategies and how we are going to be moving forward. Moving forward, we have moving called forward. on our... <laughs> moving Sorry. forward, so I've got to give my shout out to my, <laughs> to my candidate, my candidate for the 16th Council Mad District, Eve. I've got to shout out Eve. He's our district leader, mm -hmm. also running for that position, so I'm in deep support of E as well. Oh. And, he, and he's on here supporting as well. Hey, that's what's up. I, I, love, I love all my people that's in the race. And I wanna make some room for some other shout outs, but let me close this out properly. And for those of you who wanna stay on past eight o'clock, I'm with you, we can do all the shout outs, but I wanna make sure that I keep my promise and get us out of here. Yeah. Before we close, Danny and I need to make um some remarks though. Danny, you want to go first? Yes, I just want to let know because everybody was shouting out all the and first of all, I want to thank all the elected officials for stepping up and making this public commitment.
to the residents that elected you into office. We appreciate that. But I just want to update everyone on the call that Vanessa Gibson does not support the Blueprint Plan for Change. What? I just text her and she texts me back. She supports the residents and she stands with the residents against the Blueprint. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marquise, you got it. You can close us out. <laughs> Hello, hello. Hi, I'm sorry. Mark, um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, no. my name is Melinda. My uh -huh. name is Melinda Barcin, and I live in Webster, Marsania. Before we close out, I do want you guys to know on the panel that it is, I think, going forward, some NYCHA um, employees that are, that are intentionally helping us fail Codes with like fives, they don't want to keep up with the, with the maintenance, so just like you also said about how we will fall under the category of leaks in the walls and stuff not being repaired, and that they will deem us um, unsafe conditions to live in. Um, that is, I feel, a need that needs to be addressed a little stronger, and some of the maintenance to be a little correct because they are running with this whole concept of that we are in COVID, that they don't want to do certain maintenance to the development to help us product um, proceed and go forward with better living. They're looking to push the blueprint. And I oppose the blueprint because it is not for us. It's against us in the long run. Thank Amen. you for hearing me out. Amen. R Ramona, could you close us out and I'll, I'll do the yeah. final. Update. You know, that's a really good point, um, Ms. Belinda. That is a concern that should also be noted when we start looking at the blueprint, right? So in addition to privatizing, the blueprint maintains NYCHA current leadership as our property manager, right? So we're basically going to give up our section nine rights. We are going to give up our right to organize. We're going to give up our federal protections and we're still keeping the same housing manager. So when we are asked these questions about, do you have a plan? Do you have a plan? What is the plan? Let's be clear. The plan is to kill the blueprint. That's battle number one, right? This is a war. This is not a skirmish. So we have to think about this as stages and we have to be able and willing to conquer a stage and then go next, right? So the first one is kill the blueprint. Number two is probably something that you guys have been seeing when you're hosting your tenant leader meetings. Greg Russ is now going around and telling you that the blueprint is the reorganization plan that he owes the federal monitor. Bullshit. Call bullshit on it. The reorganization plan is something that is supposed to structure NYCHA in a way that it serves its tenants. And I say tenants because tenants is a word that allows us to gain ownership of our units. Residents does not from a legal standpoint. So you have to be willing to kill that blueprint and you have to be willing to call bullshit on his reorganization plan. Because what he has done with the reorganization plan is try to sell you the blueprint broken up into different categories. He is now staffing NYCHA to make the blueprint a reality. He is getting rid of property management, property development, and hiring real estate people. Why? He does that. So stop asking what is the plan? That is the plan. The plan is kill the blueprint. If you need support, sharing your opinion, giving your opinion, amplifying your opinion, we are there every single Sunday to help you do that. If you need clarification on the blueprint plan, we're there every single Sunday to do that. 
Then as a group of tenants, we're going to do the work that NYCHA didn't do. That's number three, right? We come up with a plan. No one here should be telling you what the answer is for the future of public housing. By being born, I said this on Sunday, by being born on this planet, you have certain human rights. Housing is one of those. NYCHA has been violating your human rights. Public housing authorities have been violating your human rights. So when you decide that you wanna take back that right and that you're gonna call bullshit on the blueprint and that you're gonna demand a reorganization plan that restructures how our floors are cleaned, how our painting is done, how customer service is done at the front office of your management office. Take a stand in your power and come to a meeting and come up with the plan. Because I am not going to sit here and give you answers. None of us should. And I appreciate that all the elected officials are against the blueprint, but I need you to be for the pocketbook. Every single elected official that is saying no to the blueprint needs to be saying yes to funding NYCHA. Because the reason that NYCHA is in this situation is because we don't have the funding. So Congress needs to fund this. You're in city council, talk to your state representative, talk to your state senator, talk to your congressperson, build a coalition for public housing residents who will be voting in force this coming election season and make sure that your pocketbook is in alignment with our priorities. Because telling us you're here for no to the blueprint, not, not enough. Because I'm no to having to put out a bucket every time it rains. So stop asking what is the plan? Step in that power and let's build the damn plan. And let's build the answers and let's do that together. Y'all got Damn. Brownie barking at me, man. <laughs> well, if that I'm ain't the powerful way to end. Thank we you all sleep. so much for coming. I'm looking forward. I'm recognizing faces here. I hope I see you on Sunday. We are going to go ahead and drop the uh, Zoom link for Sunday. Uh, if you registered for this meeting, I will be emailing you a follow-up where you can get a copy of this video. If you have not sent a letter to your elected official, you will also get a sample letter that you can update and send it to your elected official. And stay tuned because more big forums like this are coming. So thank oh. you all and have a good night. And let's not forget, talk to your neighbors. Let your neighbors know what's going on. They're lost. They have no clue what is happening. They're looking at Mr. Russ and they're believing him. So you, each one of you on this call, have got to speak to somebody else and educate them as to what is going down. Please join us. Um, for the elected officials, anyone who's, they're welcome to come. But 